Good afternoon. The main motivation for this talk is a great inequality that goes largely unnoticed. Some people have access to very good book collections and most people do not. My main point in this talk is to present a philanthropic proposal to do something about this inequality. Publish personal book collections in public libraries. I am also going to suggest two narratives to address two omissions in some big history courses some milestones of mathematics and physics, and some milestones of book publication. I think that mathematics and physics are important in how we see the world, and the publication narrative will be useful to explain my philanthropic proposal. The tool that I'm going to use for these issues is a big history concept, which I call bottom-up story. It is a way to think about the formation of complex aggregations, and it is a generalization of Tyler Ball's combogenesis concept. I will explain later more in detail why I, I claim that. So the plan for the talk is the big history concept, then the conf concept formation and unification narrative. For short, I will just call it a concept formation narrative. This is a narrative that includes some milestones of mathematics and physics. Then the publication narrative, which is the one that includes some milestones of book publication. Then my philanthropic proposal and the conclusions. Let's start with the big history concept. It is just a story. Once upon a time, there was one unit, which somehow became two, which somehow became many, and among them, one or more types of relationships appeared. And then, somehow, a sort of membrane appeared around them. And if we forget the contents of the membrane, we get a new unit of a higher level. And then the story starts again, or iterates. We have one unit, which somehow becomes two, and so on. Based on the big history courses that we teach, what interpretations can we give to this abstract story? One interpretation would be to think that the small units are atoms and the large ones molecules, or that we have molecules and cells, or that, or that we have individuals and societies. What I'm saying is not really new to you, because five years ago, Tyler Bolk introduced in this conference, in a talk uh, in this conference, his concept of combogenesis, where things and relations from a prior level would become a new thing at, at a new level. But he restricted his sequence, he, his term for uh, events in, a, in what he calls a grand sequence. Here are the 12 levels of the grand sequence, according to Tyler Bock. As you can see, he restricted the term to tangible things and social groups. I call the big history concept bottom-up story and I emphasize that the units somehow reproduce or we humans can reproduce them. As you will see later, I'll apply the concept to things outside uh, Tyler Box uh, grand sequence. Okay, let's move to the first narrative. As a motivation for it and as additional motivation, uh, uh, I'm going to point out to the similarities between big history courses and Montessori primary education. In Montessori primary schools, they teach these five stories creation of the earth, beginning of life, coming of humans, story of language, and story of mathematics. This points to an omission. I mean, the first four are covered in big history courses, but the last one, at least in the OER project big history course, which is the one I teach, there is barely any mention about the history of mathematics. Okay, let's get uh, started with the narrative. It starts with the appearance of symbolic language, which is defined as our ability to use sounds or gestures to represent concepts that refer to many things or ideas. This is very similar to what Douglas Hostarter, famous for the book uh, Get a Leisure Back, and Emmanuel Sander propose in this book subtitle Analogy as the Fuel and Fire of Thinking. Their thesis is that repeated analogies expand and create concepts. Note that earlier, what I did was to show a series of analog analogies uh, to, to explain you, to introduce a concept. To make clearer what Hofstadter and Sander mean, I'm going to use some images taken from a great talk by Hofstadter that is available on YouTube. In that talk, he shows these two pictures of the same tree in different seasons of the year. The top tree was, uh, the top picture was taken um, during the summer. So you can see clearly the shadow of the tree there. The bottom one has something that looks like a shadow, but it was taken 
in a cloudy day during winter. What had happened was that it had snowed recently and the snow fell, but it didn't fell in that area, that black patch at the bottom, because the tree covered that area. So Hofstadter says, oh, we could call that black area a uh, snow shadow. Then uh, later, another example that uh, Hofstadter gives is that he knew of someone that was moving to northern Norway. And he commented, oh, that must be very cold. And then they explained him, no, that the uh, northern Norway is warmer than southern Norway. The reason is that the Gulf Stream, represented in, in this image by the red lines, reaches northern, northern Norway, whereas it does not reach southern Norway, because in a sense, southern Norway is in the shadow of Great Britain. So that would be like a Gulf Stream shadow. So from these analogies between the, our standard shadow, the snow shadow, and the Gulf Stream shadow, we could generalize the concept of shadow to, to have a, a more general uh, concept. So another idea that uh, Hofstadter introduces in his talk is the idea of chunking, where we humans can take basic concepts, interrelate them in some way, many times with analogies, to create a, a larger conceptual unit. And then he explains with this diagram that uh, we humans have the special magic of uh, endless limited chunking. Okay, I mean, the image is uh, representing larger and larger concepts. Now, I was very surprised when I noticed that this diagram is strikingly similar to this one by Thaler Bolk when he's playing the concept of combogenesis. I mean, both are using uh, three circles within a circle. I was even more surprised when I noticed that this type of diagram also appears in Arthur Kessler's The Ghost in the Machine. In this book, Kessler introduced the holon concept, something that is simultaneously a whole and a part. And about 10 years later, he refined the concept in this, in this other book. And he, he mentioned that uh, there a holon may be applied to, I mean, the, the term can be applied to a subsystem in a biological, social, or cognitive hierarchy. So note that he was already including cognitive hierarchies in, in his analogy together with biological and social ones. But in this, at least in this diagram, Kessler was not telling a story. Whereas Tyler Bolk here and Douglas Hofstadter here are telling stories. I think that this distinction is important because in my opinion, a problem with this diagram is that it just shows the result. In my experience, a problem with education is that it tends to describe results, not the processes that led to them. That's why instead of this diagram, I'm going to use this one, which tries to show the process of how we got the result. In this diagram, I'm omitting the white arrows in, in, that would uh, represent analogies among the, the concepts in the, in the middle box, I mean, for simplicity, okay? But okay, let's go back to the story according to Hofstadter and Alexander. According to them, we start with, from perceptions, note analogies among them, and then we create concepts. Later from those basic concepts, we go to more abstract ones, and from them we go to even more abstract concepts, and so on. And so, as an example, when we are very young, we meet some animals at home, in the street, in the park, or in images on any media, and we create the concept of dogs. Later, from images like this, we create the concept of number, in this case in particular of number three. And I tell my students that one day they may see three dogs walking down the street, but they will never see number three walking down the street because that's really abstract. Later, uh, when we start studying algebra, we get used to adding letters instead of adding numbers. Now, something else that we learn is to add cyclically the hours. For example, if it's 9 a.m. and we say what time will be in six hours, we could say 3 p.m., even though 9 plus 6 is not 3. And if instead of 12 hours, we will have four that represent the seasons or two that represent even and odds, we could also add them cyclically. And it was Gauss that around 1800 generalized these concepts to create modular arithmetic. So this is just one example of many that, uh, of generalizations that uh, mathematics has. But not all chunking in mathematics are generalizations. For centuries, 
uh, these two worlds used to belong to two different mathematical worlds. Equation belonged to algebra and circle to geometry. Until Descartes invented Cartesian co coordinates, and we could start uh, talking about the equation of a circle. I was surprised when I learned that uh, such a major milestone in the history of mathematics was published together with the famous philosophy book, Discourse on the Method. So what Descartes and Fermat achieved when they invented analytic geometry was a merger of two mathematical worlds, not a generalization. So that's another type of chunky. So in this map of mathematics, I mean, you can see that a mathematics is full of these layers and layers of abstractions, I mean, which can be generalizations or mergers, okay? At the top of this map, uh, we have general relativity and quantum field theory, which are physics concepts. This lets me, leads me to talk about some milestones of, uh, of physics that can be described as unification or mergers of concepts. At least in Aristotle, we used to think that physics on Earth, where things tend to go to the center of the planet, and physics on heaven, where things tend to float, were two different physics. A great achievement of Newton in the 18th century when he published his Principia was the unification of these two physics with his law of universal gravitation. He proved that the same force, gravity, can explain the apple falling from the tree and the moon going around Earth. In the 19th century, Maxwell unified the two physical phenomena of electricity and magnetism in his equations of electromagnetism. And then he realized that the speed of the electromagnetic waves was exactly the same as the speed of light. So later he, he proved that uh, light could also be seen, described as an electromagnetic wave. Also in the 19th century, Joule and other physicists unified a variety of physical concepts into the concept, and very important concept of energy. And for a long time, we used to have the law of conservation of energy and the law of conservation of mass. And a great achievement of Einstein in 1905 with his mass energy equivalence was to show theoretically that we could go from one to the other. When later that was proven practically, the, the, consequences, the consequences were huge. To summarize, the concept formation and unification narrative that I suggest to use to include some milestones of mathematics and physics in history courses starts with the, the appearance of symbolic language, then continues with Hofstadter and Sanders' thesis that analogies create and expand concepts, and then with stories of some milestones of mathematics and physics. Going back to the big history concept, Hopefully now it's clear why I claim that the bottom of story is a generalization of Tyler Volk's Combogenesis concept. A particular case of bottom story is the concept formation according to Hofstadter and Sander, and also some stories uh, of some milestones of mathematics and physics. Now let's move to the publication narrative. In Maps of Time, David Cleason has an exhaustive table of information revolutions in human history. This is just part of it. I want to point that he has writing uh, 3000 and 2000 millennia BC and printing from 8th century CE. I think that he's missing there uh, this bottom-up story, published books and libraries. I'm going to base what I'm saying on a hypothesis presented by Karl Popper in this uh, chapter of, of the book In Search of a Better World. He says there that he thinks that books and libraries are perhaps the most important physical things in human civilization. His hypothesis is about how to explain the flourishing of culture in classical Athens. He thinks that uh, it can be partially explained by the invention of the written book, book publication, and book markets. He thinks that the very first time that someone, at least in Europe, uh, sat down with the intention to write, with the intention of publishing, was uh, back there and then in classical Athens. And he, he says that, um, according to his hypothesis, uh, the cultural revolution that happened there was comparable to what the one started 2,000 years later by Gutenberg's invention of movable type printing, obviously at, at a smaller scale. No? The point of Popper is that when someone writes um, with the intention of publishing, 
that person writes a draft, revises it, I mean, uh, writes a second draft, I mean, self-criticize, improves as much as it can. Then ask quest, uh, for comments from friends to make even more improvements before publishing. And once uh, the book is published, then uh, they get uh, comments from a wider, wider audience. And if there are several authors doing that, they can learn from the work of others. So you have cooperation and competition of ideas. In summary, his idea is that, um, that that book publication and book markets created a positive feedback loop of learning. And this fits very well with what David Christian says about the role of positive feedback loops in transitions to new levels of complexity. To add more, one more item to the, to the narrative, I want to talk about the article that appears in the first uh, number of the association newsletter. The whole newsletter is dedicated to a single out, uh, uh, article by Lawrence Husick, um, where he ranks the top 25 most important human innovations. By innovation, he means not necessarily a tangible invention or product, but he includes methods or ideas that add value. And sorry for the spoiler, uh, if you haven't read the article or seen, watch the video, which is, by the way, available to download from that website, um, the, at the very top of, the, of his ranking, he has what he calls intentional pedagogy. It's the idea that humans can intentionally transmit knowledge to others. Okay, he says that uh, that's what allowed the transmission of culture from one generation to the next. But he needs to mention the impact that teaching has on the teachers. All educators know that the best way to learn something is to teach it. Why is that? Because when you are going to teach something, you need to think about the subject, I mean, organize your thoughts more clearly, and, uh, and then explain it. And probably the first time you explain it, you didn't do it that well. So you criticize yourself, you improve the second time you explain it, you do it better. And, and the third time even better. And, and, uh, and, and then you can get questions from the students and, and then you, you improve. So, so I think my, my, I propose to think about it as a way of oral, I mean, I'm talking about the very original intentional pedagogy. We don't know if it was an oral or gesture way. I mean, but it, it, my point is that we can think about this as a, in a very small scale, like a publication because it was transmitting the knowledge to others and get questions from others. So my, my, my point is, I think that at a very small scale, there was a learning feedback loop back then. So if we add this to the narrative, we could summarize it the following way. So the publication narrative um, would start with the original intentional pedagogy, thinking about it as a, as a, a form of publication. Then it continues with the history of published books. So what happened in classical Athens, according to Karl Popper's hypothesis. And then, of course, in this narrative, we should include events in other civilizations. For example, the flourishing of culture that happened uh, after the publication of books in China, Song and Ming dynasties. And then what happened in Europe uh, after Gutenberg's uh, invention of movable type printing. The idea is to emphasize the learning feedback blue loops that appear uh, with publication and also to highlight the importance of books, which are a technology that many times is underestimated and taken for granted. As Carl Sagan stated in Cosmos, books prove that humans can work magic. Okay, now the philanthropic proposal. Let's just start with this bottom-up story, where instead of libraries, I have put personal book collections. In personal book collections, the relationships among the books can be of several types. They could be some books referencing other books. You could have sequence of books, similarities. You could have debates. I mean, different theories competing with each other, or you could have different versions of a history. So um, I mentioned personal book, book publications because in the last few centuries, there are hundreds, if not thousands of examples of people influenced by very good book collections. Here is just one. This morning, we heard Fred Spear giving a keynote talk. 10 years ago, he gave this one, which is available on YouTube, where he mentioned that one of his grandparents had a collection of what he calls incipient big histories. In this example, a book from the 18th century, uh, I think he says, explains that the book starts with a biblical Genesis story, and then it continues and at some point switches to the latest scientific knowledge at the time. 
The point is that Fred Spear is, is, explains that uh, he, uh, this book collection influenced him into becoming interested in, in big history. Now imagine if Fred Spear Grandad could have made available that collection to many young people. So my proposal is, my philanthropic proposal is to publish personal book collections to make them available in public libraries. And by publication, I just mean buying the books again and sending them to the public libraries to keep to be kept together. Okay. Um, as an example, in this next Netflix documentary, its creator asks Bill Gates, "How do you choose what to read?" Part of his answer is, "In the area of energy, Buckler Smith has written every one of these books that he points to this shelf where he has his Buckler Smith book collection." In his blog, Bill Gates only has superlatives about these books. He says that he waits for new Douglas Mill books the way some people wait for the next Star Wars movie, and that he has learned more about energy and its impact on society from Douglas Mill than from any other single source. So in this particular example, my proposal is that Bill Gates could choose his top 10 Douglas Mill books and Cheap and donate copies of them to collection those collections to to countries uh, developing countries. Because Bill Gates is such a public figure, if we were to do this in a large scale, let's say uh, these donations would became would make Buckley's Mill more famous than even more famous than he already is. Additionally, every time Buckley's Mill publishes a new book, Bill Gates could judge if to include it or not. I mean, he could uh, in, include. I mean, ship around the world these uh, new books as soon as they are published. So uh, let's call life a collection that is updated this way. Now, we don't need to be Bill Gates to use this idea. There are many successful professionals from developing countries that can donate good life coll book collections to libraries there. And what I'm saying is not just a theory. Since 2001, I have been donating a collection called History of Ideas to my alma mater in Venezuela. The driving question that motivates this collection is very simple. Which books you find in the book, uh, in the history section of bookshops and libraries? My experience is that they are in political and military history. And I wonder, couldn't we have a section with science history, art history, uh, the history of uh, technology, business, and sports, the history of things that we use every day and take for granted. For you to understand me better, I think that a background story would help. In 1979, I was lucky to participate in a Venezuelan mathematical competition. And I got as a prize this encyclopedia. I mean, it was a Spanish version of this mathematics encyclopedia. That changed my life. I developed a passion for history of mathematics. Later, at the university when I studied math, I decided to, to do the following. Before every course, let's say before taking my first formal course on probabilities, I would go to my encyclopedia and read all what it had about history of, of probabilities, including some articles by the people that created uh, the, uh, the original ideas about probabilities. So when I started my formal course, I had a context in my mind that allowed me to understand better some things. Since to that context, sometimes I would ask questions that would surprise my classmates. They would look at me as if we're a Martian. But I wasn't. I was just lucky to have this encyclopedia at home while they didn't have access to it. And doing that during uh, uh, my mathematics degree, I, I became convinced that a history of a subject is a good introduction to it. Later, I decided to, to collect history of many subjects. And now, on the other side, for people that are experts in a field, they always welcome uh, as a gift uh, books about the history of their subject. So my idea of sending this collection and keeping it all together is that when specialists go to see the history of the subject, they, they are also motivated to read histories of other disciplines and, and, and learn more about them. I personally love reading history of different disciplines because they show the milestones, the efforts, the mistakes, the controversies. In general, they show the processes that led to achieve some difficult results. So what I have done is sitting here in London, 
thanks to online bookshops, I have sent books to Venezuela from uh, several countries, even some countries that I have never visited in, in my life. Here are some pictures of the collection. I sent a collection of uh, comic books. I mean, this is a genre that has appeared in the last few decades. I mean, uh, writing about serious topics in comic book format. A pioneer of that is Larry Gonick. And in this Logic Comics, the main character is Bertrand Russell, who is one of my favorite philosophers. And these are my favorite educators. I also sent a collection of children's books. When I bought Get a Leisure Back, back in the 80s, one thing I learned from that book was that uh, something called Pulitzer Prize existed. Back then, I wondered, how could I uh, find all the list of Pulitzer Prize winners? At the time, it was difficult, if not impossible. Once internet appeared, it became trivial. You just go to the Pulitzer Prize website, and you find not just a list of winners. You find uh, all the candidates that didn't win. Thanks to that website, I found great books of history, for example, this history of oil. And every time a documentary has been based on, on those books, I have included them in the collection. I have not read all these books. I mean, the ones I have read are extremely high quality. So I trust policy prices that the, the ones I haven't read are also great quality. I don't know if you know this collection, 250 milestones. For each milestone, they have this format. And this is a collection, 15 books, um, mostly about science, as you can see. I love this collection so much that I have donated it to the school where um, one of my sons teaches. And people in London are surprised about these books. I have found that they are not available on physical bookshops. Um, but imagine the reaction of receiving this collection in a country where these books are not even published. In December 2017, this was the reaction. They had the nativity, and they put the books next to, next to the wise men. That is Alejandro Teruel, the director of the library back then. Hopefully, he's uh, with us today. So the collection is a copy of my personal library here in London. And uh, I call it a telepersonal library because I offer the community there the possibility of experience a visit here uh, to this that he is in London, in another continent. I think that had I achieved this using virtual reality helmets and virtual reality gloves, uh, I think that I would, I would have gotten more attention. I just did it using physical reality instead of virtual one. So I went to, to this level. If you think a personal library as a collection of collections, well, I, I went to this level, okay? And uh, Popper says that one, well, I'm sorry, and the point is that once technology allows to make one copy, that means that we can make many. These two circles here represent my collection here in London and the collection, the copy in, in Venezuela. And I'm looking for more libraries where I can make more copies to continue this story. Now, Karl Popper says that when you publish, you get you self-criticize. Well, I used to have this, just these two pocket books about these histories. And when I decided to donate, I mean, to publish my, my, personal, my personal library, I went for the very best books I could find. Then a friend, a paper says, oh, you get a, a criticism from others. Well, a friend suggested me, why don't you include some science classics? So I bought this, including al Algebra, and Darwin's Origin of the Species. Regarding one of the most important books in the history of mathematics, Euclid's Elements, this was the first version I found. Very hard to read, very large footnotes. Later, this version appeared, uh, la uh, larger format, clearer. But later, surprisingly, Taschen, the art publishing house, published this beautiful edition of Euclid's Elements, where colors are used to describe areas, uh, length of segments, and angles. Talking about Pythagoras theorem proofs, my favorite one is available to buy in the form of earrings. I think that this could, they could be handy in case of meeting an alien civilization. I have brought some of, uh, I could give you some after, after, uh, after the talk. Even before the popularization of internet, Neil Postman and others were talking about information overload. But as Carl Sagan says, the trick is to know which books to read. The writer Kel Schirke actually thinks that the problem is not information overload, that is filter failure. My proposal includes at least three layers of filter, the publishers, the curator's donors, and the librarians. It is easy to adapt this idea to create a big history book collection that we could donate around the world uh, to places where we teach remotely. This is just an example of things that we could include in such a collection. 
Larry Gonick says at the very beginning of Cartoon History of the Universe that uh, he built a time machine, that it was just a pile of all history books. Guess what? We can reproduce the time machines now. So I hope that now my philanthropic proposal is, is clearer. I mean, that what I mean by that. So the conclusions. I have introduced a generalization of Tyler Ball's homogenesis concept. I have suggested to use this narrative to include some milestones of mathematics and physics in big history courses. This narrative is analogous to the convogenesis story. I have also suggested to include the publication narrative to include the history of published books in big history courses. And then I have combined the bottom-up story concept and the publication narrative to explain my philanthropic proposal. I should mention that I'm looking for university libraries that would accept the donation of a history of ideas collection. I would like to start in other Latin American countries. It would be great if other people would join the idea of donating very good book collections to developing countries. Particularly if famous people like Bill Gates were to do it, then the donations would have much more impact. This way we could try to do something about the great inequality that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>